Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 137, Gay Men in the Heteronormative University. This is our second vlog in our social justice quartet and it comes via request from John. John, this one is for you. So what we're going to explore in the vlog today is why all of us keep bouncing into the structures of heteronormativity both inside and outside our universities. But this is not only a vlog of diagnosis and understanding, it is also a proactive vlog that shows how you and I today can make a difference. We can challenge and we can transform. We can make our universities, we can make the world just a little bit better. And it starts today. So please note that I'm not going to slam together gay, lesbian, bisexual, the transgender community or indeed any of our queer identifying communities. If I slammed all those communities together, not recognising their difference, the specificity of their history, then of course I'm being heteronormative. So we are starting with gay men because that was the request from John, but I hope and we'll see what happens as these vlogs continue. If any of you out there would like a discussion of lesbians in our university, queer identifying, our trans community, the bisexual community, of course every single one of those men and women have different histories, experiences and trajectories and they deserve that specificity to be recognised. So let's see what we do going forward and I really hope that does happen today we're starting with gay men and heteronormativity and indeed let's start off with those two terms gay heteronormativity what is going on there well sex and sexuality is defined in many different ways via hormones or chromosomes or biology in some form but before we enter that great story of chromosomes <laughs> Uh, I'm going to make another suggestion to you. I'm actually much more interested in the function of homosexuality in our legal and social frameworks. It is a punctuation of some kind. So let's think about how it operates in our legal and social spaces and that might help us understand what's going on in our universities. So the reason why gay men and gay communities are demonised, marginalised and confront discrimination is because of the supposed threat that homosexuality holds for the heterosexual population. Now therefore we need to think about heteronormativity. What's going on there? Well heteronormativity refers to the assumption that every single one of us is heterosexual and that is normal and that is right and that is proper and that is true. Let me explain that in a different way. Whenever we meet somebody, whether it's in a grocery shop, whether it's in a bar, whether it's in a gym, the assumption is the person that we are meeting is straight. That assumption is heteronormativity. Now, we don't know them. We've got no idea who they are, really, and yet we assume that they are heterosexual and we assume all the assumptions that come along with being a heterosexual. So what are those assumptions? They're interesting ones. And think about it if, if this is how you operate in your daily life too. The assumptions of heterosexuality are that every single one of us is in a long-term relationship or looking for a long-term relationship, that we are procreative, we have children or we want to have children, that we are monogamous, one person, thanks for playing, and also that that sexual act with that special one person is in private, and that sexual private act is held with one consenting adult. So they're all the assumptions of heteronormativity. But I think we all know that life, let alone sex, is a little bit more complicated than we're suggesting here. Sexual behaviour is not only about an act, it is a consciousness of what we are doing and how we gain meaning through that experience. So there are three aspects of sexuality. There's sexual desire, sexual practices and sexual identity. Now again, we often assume that all those three variables are the same thing. Actually, they're very, very different. That what we desire may be very different from what we do, which may be very different from how we think about and put an identity label on that behaviour and on that desire. 
So sexuality is not a constant, it has rules and it has a history. In the 19th century, this was particularly the period where homosexuality was patrolled, marginalised and demonised. And remember at this point in the 19th century, right through really much of the 20th century, homosexuality was illegal in most nations. And Lord Alfred Douglas in the 1890s, the beautiful, glorious 1890s, described homosexuality with a phrase that still has resonance to this day. The love that dare not speak its name. End of quote. So Lord Alfred Douglas was responding to the Victorian idea of the family. Now this is not Victorian as in Melbourne. This is Victorian as in the Queen, right? Not that Queen, the Queen with the crown and stuff. But the Victorian idea of the family was very significant. So this dominated the 19th century and indeed beyond. This Victorian idea of the family was very rigidly structured based on a married couple raising children in a house separated from the rest of their family. That's the Victorian idea of the family. Now as the 20th century progressed, then this idea of the Victorian family started to be threatened and challenged. Lots of things happened. So the increasing education of women, women in the workplace, the rise in the level of divorce, the late age of first marriage, uh, the complexity that's going on with the housing market that we're living in Australia at the moment. So who can actually afford a standalone house in the suburbs to raise children? So the housing market had a transformation. And also, of course, the decreased number of children. So homosexuality, moving right through the 20th century, particularly through the activist period in the 1970s, where an affirmative gay community was formed, remained illegal. I think that's important to recognise here. Illegal. You would go to jail for particular sexual behaviours. So something astounding is going on here. And we have to recognise that homosexuality was only decriminalised, not rendered legal, decriminalised in New South Wales in 1985. And obviously Australia only permitted same-sex marriage in 2017. 2017. So as you can see that long tail of the Victorian family structure is still with us to this day. So as you can see a series of organisations in our culture demonise and create a discriminatory environment for the gay community. Whether it be certain professions that have done that through the development of their history but also organisations, religious organisations as well. So there is a function for demonising and marginalising gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans community. Something's going on here. So therefore, let's look at what's going on with attention to our universities. And what I'm going to do is talk through some strategies now that you and I can undertake every single day to transform our culture. Because I think we have to remember that we talked about it in the vlog last week, Procreative heterosexual masculinity dominates what we think of as leadership in our university. So we know all of that. But I'm making a, a different point about that this week. And it is important. These extraordinary straight white men in power can make an incredible difference to the role and function of gayness in our universities. And so many of our vice chancellors around the world are doing that. And I really want to affirm the straight men out there who are our vice chancellors, who are coming out in support of the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender community. That is fantastic. And that is incredibly important. And I just need to make that point that I always do. Just because you're a woman, doesn't mean you're a feminist. And just because you're a gay man doesn't mean you're a gay activist. So I think that's important. So when our leaders speak out in favour of our gay community, gay students, gay staff, they are doing something incredibly important. They are creating a safe space 
for the complicated journey in coming out and remaining safe and secure as a gay man, as a lesbian, as a member of the transgender community in our university. So I really want to pay respect to the vice chancellors out there that have really come out and about and said we are standing for this, so I have enormous respect for that. But it is also important, I think, to acknowledge our vice chancellors around the world who are gay and who have come out in public and created new and different spaces for leadership in our universities. And I particularly want to pass on my respects to Vice-Chancellor and Professor Dominic Schellard, the Vice-Chancellor of De Montford University in Leicester in the UK. And I've done some great work actually with De Montford. It's a wonderful university and they have a wonderful Vice-Chancellor. As a gay man, he's spoken out about the gifts of coming out, coming out, and he's used his leadership role to create different sort of spaces so that histories don't have to be hidden anymore. A remarkable man. So this is really what an inclusive university looks like. A university that is culturally safe, where every single person can express their best self and succeed intellectually. Remember, we're in the brain business. We can succeed intellectually and not have to deal with the anchor of oppression every single day. My colleagues in the wonderful Times Higher Education uh, in London in the last couple of years have had an incredible activist role within the publication. They've spent a lot of time talking about with feature articles on the best places to go to university as a gay and lesbian student, the best place to be a staff member if you are a gay or lesbian staff member. And importantly there is a great activist organisation in the United Kingdom called Stonewall my respect to colleagues there, and they provided, I think it was last year, a list of the 100 best places to work if you are a gay man or a lesbian. And this was fascinating to me, 12 of the 100 best places to work in the United Kingdom if you're a gay man or a lesbian was a university. How fantastic is that? I took incredible pride at that. So. We're doing a lot that's right. We need to acknowledge that, but we can always do better. And wouldn't it be great in Australia if we got a survey like that? What are the best places to work if you are a gay man or a lesbian? That's something I think that would be fantastic. But we're doing okay, I think. But as John expressed in his moving email to me, we need to do better and we need to do more. And obviously I am particularly worried and particularly concerned about what's happening in the doctoral space. So our PhD students are very precious and it is clear from John's email that he was feeling very isolated. And look, a PhD is hard enough to do anyway without confronting that sense of isolation and that sense of fear. So I really wanted to understand what's happening in doctoral programs around the world if you are a gay man. And so the research in this area was quite interesting. And we need to find strategies to, to make this better, I think. So I've gone into the research in this area and look, I was finding some odd and interesting sources, so some great stuff in the grey literature, a series of blogs, but I've also worked through the refereed literature in about the last 20 years. Most of those studies are from North America, so from the States and from Canada. Most of those studies are qualitative, so the generalizability I think is questionable to be frank, but there are models there that we can all think about to see whether they're useful in Australia and around the world today. So the first great example I found, and who knew, was a refereed article in a journal I'd never heard of, Administrative Science. Who knew that was a thing? Administrative Science. And this article was written by Andreas Tilsik, Michael Anby and Carly Knight. And they explored why gay men and lesbians were more represented in some occupations than others. And in fact they demonstrated that academia in particular, so working in a university as a scholar, was one of the favoured occupations for gay men and lesbians. And they argued that the key reason that gay scholars were being created from the gay and lesbian community and the university was a good place to work is what they described as, quote, task independence. Because the nature of academic life is we have a certain amount of independence in how we use our time task orientation and also we have a lot more flexibility about 
how we describe ourselves in public, our private space can be quite big, that was seen to be attractive for gay men and lesbians. So we tend to share information a little bit differently in a university. So that means that heteronormativity can be questioned a little bit more. But I think the remarkable research that's emerging about gay men and universities is a recent study that was published in 2018 reporting that sexual minority students, now that's not my phrase, that's the phrase that was used in the article, sexual minority students are more likely, more likely to abandon science majors more likely to abandon science degrees. So this research was completed by Bryce Hughes and it was reported in the March 14, 2018 edition of Nature. Mr Hughes completed his undergraduate degree in engineering, but when it came time to do his PhD, he moved to education to do that PhD. And what he found through his research is that he wasn't alone. Nature reported that, quote, students from sexual minorities are leaving science, technology, engineering and maths degrees in higher rates than their heterosexual classmates, end of quote. So the reason for this distinctive attrition rate has multiple causes, but obviously marginalisation and discrimination may be part of this story. Rochelle Diamond, a biologist in the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, in the wonderful Pasadena, she's also chair of the National Organization of Gay and Lesbian Scientist, Scientists and Technical Professionals. She stated that, quote, being out is a freeing thing, but finding a friendly lab or a college campus is a lot harder, end of quote. Matt Hughes in the early 2000s gave us some more flesh to this in the journal Science. What actually is going on? And Matt Hughes described the complexity of being a gay man or a lesbian in a science degree and he expressed it in such an evocative way. He argued and questioned whether or not a gay student comes out to a supervisor, whether or not they come out to their fellow lab mates, their classmates, and whether or not they talk about their partner in the university. I got strangely moved at that, and I'm strangely moved now, because you get a sense of the complexity of this situation. And this is heteronormativity. How many of us as straight people ever have to come out as straight, or wonder whether we come out to our boss, come out to our supervisor, come out to our friends as straight, whether we ever question on Monday morning telling people about what we did on the weekend with our partner. You see, that's what heteronormativity is. We never have to think about that, but our gay male students, our lesbians, the queer identifying communities, it's these rolling series of decisions that can grind our colleagues and our friends and our students down. So think about the stress involved of the revolving closet here. Coming out, not coming out. If you come out, you then risk the discrimination, either implicit or explicit, resulting from that disclosure that you can never actually take back. And so in these research papers that I've looked at in about the last 20 years or so, many of the issues expressed by John are present there. So John, you're absolutely not alone. You were right to raise this. The refereed literature is resonating with your experience, sir. So what are we going to do now? Okay, so that's the situation. What are we going to do? What can we implement today? What can we implement next week, the following month, the following year to improve this experience? Firstly, Let's do the advocate bit, shall we? Every student, every staff member, every citizen has the right to a safe, predictable, kind and compassionate working environment and university environment. And we need to affirm that. So whenever we hear, even implicitly, attacks on gayness, homosexuality, even jokes, we need to intervene here. It will make a difference. Show support verbally show support that you care that you understand 
that makes a difference. A second strategy that was published by Julian Lark and James Croteau was the use of mentoring relationships for gay men and lesbian students. This was a fascinating study. Now obviously mentoring for all students is incredibly valuable, but this study showed it was specifically valuable for gay men and lesbians, and we're going to talk about why that's the case. And the reason being was it reduced the isolation. It created a culture of support with someone in power supporting them and then provided the scaffold or the platform for them to become very successful early career researchers. So the researchers argue that this type of mentoring provides an intervention in what they describe as quote institution, an institutional homo negativity. I think that's a powerful phrase too, institutional homo-negativity. Now I think this is a powerful and an important strategy. I think Flinders should be doing this, and I will do if our students would like me to do this, let's do this like now. And by the way, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter if the mentor is gay and lesbian or straight. So the sexual identity of the mentor does not matter at all because it's not about role modeling, it's about professional advocacy. Yep. So another strategy is a great one, and this really depends on the graduate student's level of outness, and that is joining a gay, lesbian, queer identifying student community or student organisation. Now that's always great and important, but the literature, particularly in blogs, confirmed that it's hard for graduate students because when they join those student organisations, it's dominated by undergraduates and their experience is very different. So I think a clear strategy is that we have a graduate student gay, lesbian, queer identifying organisation. And if our students would like this, then you've got the Office of Graduate Researchers complete support to do that. We will facilitate what you would like to happen. I think that is also a great idea. Another option, oh I love this, just being researched by Raven McKee. He's a PhD student at Wilfrid Laurier University in the wonderful Canada. He's I love this. He is researching the promotion of bromosexual, bromosocial, bromosexual friendships. Yes, we're at the bromance. Who knew we'd go here? So this is like Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart. I mean, you just want to be them, really, don't you? So this is the relationship or the friendship between straight men and gay men. This is great. And this will seem to be particularly useful for students and particularly useful for graduate students. So he's investigating, McKee is investigating the impact of these relationships, not only on the gay men involved in this discussion, but also on the straight friends. And what he found actually is the straight guys gained incredible confidence through this process, professionally, socially, and personally, fantastic. And look, this is probably my favorite bit of research that I've read this year. And what I love is McKee is configuring all these different models for the bromance. So like the wingman model, which I particularly enjoy, or the buddy model. This is just terrific. And what's great is it showed that everybody gains from the situation. Everybody gains from the situation. It's positive, it's proactive, and both the, the gentleman's career, straight and gay, are enhanced through this relationship. What's interesting by this research is it shows that these bromances operate more effectively in Canada than the United States and also in urban environments rather than the rural or the regional. But again, look, let's be honest, these relationships, wonderful relationships, have always existed between straight men and gay men, but now we actually have some research behind it, and now we've now got a new term for it, which is just terrific. And look, these are all positive strategies to reduce isolation, provide a culture of safety, of conversation, and enable development personally and professionally. And let's be honest guys, this is the point of a university. We come to a university to represent the best of, a, what, a, of what a culture can be, not the worst. It's also necessary, I think, to provide visibility for the support structures that exist for gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender communities, very, very important. And I remember QS has provided a great list of LGBT scholarships that are available to study in the United States, Canada, Australia and Aotearoa New Zealand. I particularly want to note the Monash 
queer leaders scholarship, really powerful. So we need to increase the visibility of those support structures and try and create some more. And finally, look, I do want to talk about the importance of leadership. I'm in Melbourne as part of the Australian Council for Graduate Research. So all the deans of graduate research get together and talk about policy and stuff. So it is a discussion of leaders in this space. And therefore it seems appropriate in the beige hotel room that I actually do talk about leadership in this space. And those of us who have the great privilege of being deans of graduate research have a leadership role in this space. And part of that leadership role is that we do not permit or enable prejudice, oppression or discrimination, ever. Not on my watch. But there is a reason, therefore, why there are three, yes, three, rainbow flags in my office. I have one rainbow flag on my office door, one rainbow flag on the office door of my uh, strategic policy officer, the wonderful Karen Jacobs. Hi, Karen. She's got a rainbow flag on her desk. And indeed, right behind our reception is a rainbow flag. And there is a reason why those flags are there. I want the Office of Graduate Research to always signify safety and openness and a place where safe discussions can take place. It is a place where we counter heteronormativity. And the thing is, you do actually have to intervene to counter heteronormativity because it's assumed just about all the time that just about everybody you meet is straight and we're cool with that and we don't think about anything else at all. But with those rainbow flags, I hope they are a sign that we do intervene, we do care, and this is a different type of space. So to change this culture, we must be present and we must listen. And for the gay and the lesbian students out there, I need you to be comfortable. Ask questions of your perspective or actual dean of graduate research and ask them about their career of support, their career of activism. Because the Dean of Graduate Research is a really odd job, trust me. It's odd, it's different from any other qualification or skill set that's required at the university. Because the Dean of Graduate Research has to be an outstanding re researcher known around the world, often in interdisciplinary areas so we can move between colleges and disciplines. So it's got to be a commitment to high quality interdisciplinary research. We also have to be outstanding teachers, often with teaching qualifications, so we actually know how to supervise. We know what andragogy is, so that's quite an unusual combination in and of itself. But we also then have to manage and administer and report on legislation. So there's that sort of managerial, administrative role as well, so it's quite odd. But as John's email to me confirmed, we have to do something else. We have to do more. And look, what we have to do, what that more is, is we have to front up, we have to show some courage, and we have to be leaders. And how we lead in this area is we overtly welcome our gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender colleagues and our students. We are anti-discriminatory and we are gay affirmative, and they are different things. Now, as you can pick up, this topic means a lot to me, socially, professionally, but it also means a lot to me personally, and I would never have talked about this if John hadn't requested this vlog, to be honest. But as some of you may know, I was relatively active in my youth, youth, in acid house, techno, trip hop, trance, jungle, drum and bass communities. And in Perth and Western Australia, the acid house electronica communities were based particularly in gay clubs. And so the happiest days of my life, without a doubt, in my late teens and my early 20s were in these gay clubs dancing, discovering a new way of living through a new way of dancing. And those of you that were there know what I'm talking about. And look, I have this incredible visceral memory of New Year's Eve when 1993 became 1994. So I was just finishing the first year of my PhD. And as 1993 clicked over into 1994, I was on the dance floor in Connections nightclub. And the first song of 1994 was the Pet Shop Boys' Go West. And I was dancing 
with all my friends, 80% of whom were gay men. And as I looked around that incredible group of people dancing, their faces shining, I realised I was so incredibly happy. It was a pure happiness. And I also realised, you know what, this is what life is meant to be like. This is life in its purity, in its beauty, in its wonder and in its fun. Now, that sadly was a transitory moment. Life got pretty serious pretty quickly after that New Year's Eve night. And I got my first uh, full-time academic job in Aotearoa, New Zealand, soon after that New Year's Eve. And to be frank, I've worked pretty hard in pretty brutalising environments ever since that day. But I hold that memory with a lot of pride. And look, I still know the overwhelming majority of those remarkable men. I still know them all. Hi. <laughs> and look, they changed me. They supported me. They loved me. And they created a space for a different type of femininity and a different type of woman to emerge. And I wouldn't be who I am without those men. So, for John and all the remarkable gay men watching this video from around the world, you may be feeling alone and disconnected and disoriented and asking yourself every day why you're putting yourself through this, why you're doing a PhD. But you need to know that this particular dean and tens of thousands of students and academics and colleagues around the world care for you and we believe in you and we know that your research is going to change the world because we know that you are changing the world. I wish you love, light and peace. Tia. <laughs>